All right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming to Horticulture Corner, Dig It, with Alan Skinner of Soil, o Soil Life Organics. We're excited to have you all here today, both in person here at the Garden Club and on Zoom from your homes. And we're really excited about this program. You're going to learn a lot today. My name is Denise Reagan. I'm Executive Director of the Garden Club of Jacksonville. And I'm here with my colleague, Daniel Stark, our Operations Manager, who is helping me run this Zoom and in-person program. I'd also like to thank the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund for making programs like this possible with a generous grant. I'd also like to thank our chair, Wally Eriks, he's the chair of Horticulture Corner and would normally be here checking in uh, people tonight, but it's his birthday and his husband bought him a ticket to, I think, Jimmy Buffett. So they're enjoying that tonight. So happy birthday, Wally. And now this is my uh, little um, promo for the Garden Club. Uh, if you don't know, the Garden Club is having a matching campaign through the end of the year. We launched it on Giving Tuesday and uh, we raised several thousand dollars but it goes through the end of the year and the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund is matching up to $25,000, which is a really great shot in the arm for us. And it's a great opportunity to become a member of the Garden Club if you're not already. Um, gar Garden Club memberships make great gifts for the holidays. So if you have somebody who um, really cares about the environment or gardening or flower arranging or growing vegetables, this is a great gift to get them. So um, we have a link here that if you want, you can scan it both here in person or at home, or you can go to our website, gardenclubjacks.org slash grow. All right, now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker for the day. Alan Skinner's company, Soil Life Organics, is dedicated to helping customers optimize their soil conditions to get the best results, whether they're growing food crops, turf, or landscaping. He has, made, he has more than 11 years experience in soil health analysis with a focus on soil biology. He is a candidate to become one of only 35 soil food web consultants in the world through Dr. Elaine Ingham's certification program. He is nearing completion of a three-year natural resources conservation service, conservation innovation grant, that is a mouthful, studying soil biology at White Harvest Farms in Jacksonville. And if you have questions for Alan and you're on Zoom, please type them in the chat box. And if you're here in person, you can raise your hand and Alan will call on you and he will, uh, re he will repeat the questions so that we can record it for posterity because we'll be posting this on our blog. All right, so it's my pleasure to introduce Alan Skinner. Test, test, okay. Works properly. We have a great audiovisual group here, so that works. That's nice to have that level of talent. <laughs> Usually, it's not that way when you go to these things. Um, okay. Well, well, I'm so glad to be here. I guess you see me okay. Okay, good. Yeah, on your screen. Um, I'm gonna stand over here. I think. Um, great to be here. I, I really love. Um, I've been want, speaking in front of the Garden Club has been one of my goals because I think it's a great group. They're a very conscious group, and they care about a lot of things about growing things primarily. But about you know the environment and things like that, which I think is going to be a big part of my, my talk, just but just by its very sure. So the topic today is soil biology, and that sounds like a mighty dry subject, and, it, and, it, and it, I try to make it as interesting as possible. But it is science. But you know science is is pretty amazing and how it works. And once the whole goal of today's talk is once you understand how soil biology works, is that you can actually you'll be more thoughtful about how you grow things in your yard or at home, or even if you okay. want to have a farm of some kind. Um, <clears throat> okay, next slide. Um, so, we, we, so you can probably skip the next one. Um, Here I come. Okay, my, my, my career has been all over the map. I, I, uh, my background's mechanical engineering. Got that from UF, go Gators. Um, and, um, but then over time, I've transitioned into other career paths just by the way of, of natural occurrences. And I decided uh, when, when the Great Recession happened, uh, I was uh, had an opportunity to kind of just had some time on my hands because we got kind of reduced with our staffing and, and our, our labor rates, and I had time to go out and do some other things. And uh, this uh, I was the, this my boss, who was a land planner, had interest in this subject, and we had some, they had some products that they would had the licenses to sell that they didn't have anybody doing it. So I was going I went out door to door to farmers all over 
Columbia and uh, Sewanee County, this would have been around 2010 timeframe, trying to sell these, these products. That, and these products claims were like, hey, farmers get higher yields with less fertilizer. I went, God, that, if that's the case, I mean, shoot, I could be a millionaire selling this stuff because farmers want higher yields and let the Flo state of Florida certainly can use less fertilizers because of pollution. Um, so, but these products ended up not working. And so that was a little frustrating after having done it for several years. And these, I was a little upset with these manufacturers, but I met Dr. Ingham. Uh, she's up there. Dr. Lane Ingham is kind of the guru about soil biology. And she said, well, the problem with those, those products is that they're, they're, you're only looking at one aspect or very sl small sliver of an overall ecosystem. And to do soil biology correctly, you've got to amend soil so that it incorporates the whole ecosystem. And so, I, and she says, I have a training program that if you want to get involved with. And so I, I got involved with their training program and getting, so I'm shooting to become a soil food web consultant, which are, there are not that many in the world. And if you go to soilfoodweb.com, uh, you'll see the whole rollout of the educational program and this, these consultants and, and I'll get a referral. I, I've got a referral in the Panhandle. I've got a referral in St. Petersburg, Florida. I got to go to in January. I got some one in Sarasota that I've got going on. So a lot of work is coming in now because of, uh, of this background. Okay, next slide. Um, again, the, the, the soil is one of those things that, uh, that, that the human beings by their nature, out of sight, out of mind, if you don't see it, it doesn't exist. But in fact, it does exist. It's just microscopic. So there's a lot we don't know about soil. We know a lot about soil microbes, but a lot we still don't know. And just like your gut biome, we're still learning about how that works. And that's, that's, there's a lot of things they're, they're finding out about the gut biome in terms of you know, mental health uh, issues and things like that. They're, they're hopefully will solve a lot of these issues. Okay. Um, so simply just a few questions. These are kind of stupid questions, actually. But, but like, uh, does anybody know the difference between soil and dirt? Life, exactly. Nailed it. So yeah, dirt has no life in it. Soil does, you know. And so when, and most of the soils that you see that man has impacted are in, in our world is dirt. Doesn't have the soil life in it. And then also, do forest rangers fertilize trees in Yosemite? Of course not. I mean, then why does why does why do trees grow in Yosemite? But I got to fertilize my yard. I don't understand why they grow, and I don't they don't do it. So these are things we're gonna they'll kind of explain how this, how this works. Okay, next slide. So in in in, in our on our planet, there's arguably, except for the water on our planet, there's only there's two conditions of land. It's either been impacted by man or not impacted. And so impacted land could be a farm, it could be a yard, it could be a golf course, it could be a development or whatever. And un unimpacted land is land that man has never touched or human beings have never touched. And so there, there's a big difference in the soil biology in those two conditions. Um, so soil, I gotta always got to give a little background on soil. For those of you who may or may not know about soil, um, e soil um, ecology, you want to one, how does soil work? And there's really about four, like a four-legged stool. First of all, the soil structure, it, you know, the sand, silt, and clay um, combination. Of course, you know, sand, uh, clay particles are smallest, silt are a little bit bigger, but sand uh, particles are the biggest. And in Florida, North Florida, Where we have mostly it? silty sand, which is a very good compacting material. Um, but there, I mean, sometimes we'll run into it? gumbo clay and things like that. Okay. There's also the soil minerals, your, your calcium, phosphorus, potassium, things like that. That's kind of like the the uh, the food for the for the plants. Uh, organic matter is uh, is what is the home for the microbes, you get microorganisms, and so that's a very important component of soil. Used in our ideal soil would have about a three percent organic matter. Our Florida soils are about one and a half, so we're low, you know. And so that's an always a tough number to get up to the threes or three to fives. So and then lastly, are the uh, the soil microbes themselves? Um, so the, these are all things that in a healthy, good soil, fertile soil, you'd have all these, these things in good balance. Now, this is, this is very important to know, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm not a classically trained botanist or anything. I've just learned a lot from a lot of people uh, about how plants grow. But in a, in a nutshell, plants uh, want their nutrients in a soluble form. So why do fertilizers work? Because they're soluble. They're either liquid and they get absorbed into the root system, or they're granular and they get dissolved in irrigation or rainfall and they get absorbed in the rain into the root system. But, but th that's the way plants want their nutrients. But uh, in nature, you don't have fertilizers, right? So then how does, how does nutrients become soluble? In, in your sand, silt, and clay, and your pebbles, and your, your organic matter, 
you've got all these insoluble nutrients that have to be converted into a soluble form for the plants. And that's where the biology comes in. So in soils that have robust biological populations, they're out there just working, churning away, making those nutrients available to the, for the plant. So um, we keep going yet. Yeah. Okay, this is a real life situation that, that I experienced. Uh, 1970, I was a young, young guy. And um, this is, a, this is a, some land we had over by Bay Meadows. Um, you can see 1970, that's a side view of a pine, of a pine forest. And it was probably a native pine, pine forest where you had pine trees you had, and then you had palmettos and you see topsoil and subgrade. And my dad said, well, we want to clear that and plant more pine trees. You know, we want to make some money and then plant some more pine trees and get more density and all that. So he thought he was being smart. So what he did was I'm going to get a bulldozer and, and, you know, cut all the trees down and sell them and then clear cut and then pile all the, all the, take all the topsoil and debris and palmetto roots and all that and pile it up in these giant wind rows that you're kind of looking at, you know, cross section of a wind row into, into the page. And, um, and, and so that, and that way it made a nice little tabletop where you could plant pine trees. Well, 20 years later, and I, I planted 20,000 pine trees myself behind a tractor. It was a brutal job. But 20 years later, I go out there and look at this forest and I, and I started to shed a tear because uh, the, the trees that were right next to the berms were that big around. This is after 20 years, that big around and 60 feet tall. After I planted them 20 years before, the ones out in the middle, farthest away from the berms, were that big around and maybe 15 feet tall. Same plant at the exact same time, no fertilizers, no nothing. So all the organic matter just was sloughing off from that berm and feeding those trees next to the berm. And that, and there was, that's, that in, it, in itself was enough to make those trees grow that big around and 60 feet tall. Um, the training with Dr. Ingham I'm doing is, is all about the microscope. Now, sounds, again, it's a real nerdy thing, but there's no arguing. This, is the, this sounds really kind of nerdy, but the microscope does not lie. When I, I, I assess soil, I assess uh, compost, and, I, and if you brought a soil sample to me or a compost sample, I can tell you in five minutes if it's good from a biological perspective. Does it have a lot of life in it? And that, will that life be there to really make things happen for the plant? So um, it does not lie. I mean, the, and you also learn a lot about diseases. Uh, I can I can identify diseases too. So that's another thing that I've. It's a great tool. So then you can kind of click through this. So when in terms of evolution, basically, uh, plants came after bacteria and fungi, and so plants they co-evolve. So plants and have a symbiotic relationship with bacteria and fungi, where they they both need each other. The bacteria and fungi actually get fed by the plants, and the plants get fed by the bacteria and fungi. So this is kind of a food chain. You know, remember like in fifth grade science, you had like the food chain. Like in, I always use the ocean example. So you have like you know krill or or the um, or uh, the little tiny shrimp things that that the sardines will eat, and then a tuna eat the sardines, and then the great white sharks eat the tuna. Let's say that's a food food chain, right? Well, you say I have the exact same thing underground. So this is what underground looks like. So the very bottom of the food chain are bacteria and fungi. And they're the ones that that's like the foot soldiers in the soil world. They're doing they're 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 in the highest populations and they're working their tails off trying to provide nutrients uh, to the plants. However, that line where it goes from prey to predator, that line has in order for the nutrients to be released, like all the nutrients are bound up in these in the bacterial bodies and the fungal strands. It's bound up in their bodies, and until that gets eaten and then pooped out, it's called the poop cycle, kind of funny, um, that's when their nutrients get released. So everything above the fungi and bacteria, the protozoa, nematodes, and earthworms are critical to making the release of nutrients. Okay, we can make it. So the, no, this is hard to see. Um, upper left is, if I look under a microscope, this is 400 power. Uh, just to real quickly, but upper left is little dots. Those are bacteria. On the right is a fungal strand, and it's in the fungal strands. A good fungal strand is going to be a uh, a colored uh, strand that's got septa like bamboo, and it's going to be a pretty thick diameter. But it's got a constant diameter like a pipe. And then the lower left is a little round. The football thing in the middle is amoeba. It's a test what they call a testate amoeba. It's a good guy. It's a predator of the bacteria, and that's a nematode on the lower right hand. And nematodes are really 
do a lot of the nutrient cycling, there that, that nematode is going to eat a lot of bacteria. It's going to poop out a lot of fertilizer. So you can click on. Um, this is this is the really this this really gets me excited about this subject because succession uh, succession is is a concept where if you think about a bare soil, what's the first plant to grow on bare soil? Weeds. So weed is a early successional plant, and so as you march from left to right, the the at low six, early successionals on the left, and as you march through like. Maybe next to weeds, you might have some small grasses. And then next level is maybe tall grasses. Then you might get some small trees or shrubs, like blue blueberry or something like that. Then you got a, you know, like an oak tree. And then you got old growth. And what's interesting is you'll notice that the, the bacteria and fungi changes all throughout the successional layer, I mean, the successional um, spectrum. So you'll notice on the left, in, in really, really poor soils, you have uh, maybe some bacteria, but no fungi at all. And maybe a little more bacteria, but not much fungi. But you notice that look what happens to the ratio of, of uh, fungi to bacteria. So as you go to old growth, you have mostly fungi, but very little bacteria. So it's a, it's a, every plant, this is the most important thing that you need to take away today, is that every plant in our nature, in our natural community world, that we either is either a domesticated plant or a plant that's in the wild, has an optimum fungal to bacteria ratio. So what you want to do is when you're growing things at home, whether it's a vegetable or whether it's a shrub or a turf, you want to mimic that nat the thing, the natural community it came from, because that's what the plant wants. That plant thrives in that environment. Okay, so you can click. And this is hard to read, but uh, this is kind of a, these are target, um, in, in Dr. Ingham's teachings, she tells you what, what target, minimum targets you have to have to have successful um, nutrient cycling. Nutrient cycling is, does anybody know what a flywheel is? A flywheel is kind of a giant wheel that's got a lot of mass. And once you get it going, it just keeps on going. It's got a lot of inertia. And the whole point of getting, if you want to grow things biologically, you want to get some, a lot of organic, organic matter and a lot of biology. And then what will happen is you get enough biology with enough predators and the prey, it'll start just feeding itself nonstop. And guess what? When that happens, you don't need to fertilize. You know, you don't, irrigation requirements go way down. A lot of positives happen, but to get that flywheel cranking, it's like it's, it's heavy to cr get cranking. You got to really work hard at building these levels up. And so these are the target target levels that when, when a client says, "Hey, I want to grow blueberries," then I go, "Okay, what do I? How many uh, how much how many fungi fungi do you need in your soil? How many bacteria? How many protozoa?" And, I, and that's that's my goal is to help that customer reach those levels. Now this is this is a little hard to read, but Follow me with it. So if you go clockwise, you'll notice it goes from early successional all the way to old growth. You see how it goes from bare parent, food web, um, weeds, or early annuals, mid grasses, pasture. And you see that the fungal to bacteria ratio gets higher and higher because it's really low up near weeds. It's 0.1, which means that that's very little fungi and, and a lot of bacteria. Um, and so you Going clockwise is, let's, is, you know, let's say that you want to grow blueberries. Well, you've got to really work hard to get your, you're probably going to be around two to one to five to one. So you've got to really work hard to get your biology correct in your soils. But here's what happens when you, you notice that the counterclockwise loop are things that push you backwards toward early successional. And like Mother Nature does that. In Mother Nature, if a big flood comes through and wipes everything out, you're starting over. You know, the volcanic St. Helens, uh, Mount St. Helens eruption, it's starting over again. Yellowstone had a massive fire about, what, 15, 20 years ago. It was a mature lodgepole pine forest. It's back to zero again. So what, early successional plants come, then the next successional, and it starts all over again. And then man-made, you can have fertilizers, will set you back as well. So, so th this, this is very, very important to understand because let's say that I'm trying to grow, grow blueberries and blueberries are say a five to one ratio bushes, right? But if, but if I'm dosing it with a lot of fertilizers that kills a lot of these other organisms and it, it's, you're growing in a weed type soil. And that's the, the blueberries going, I'm not a weed, I'm a blueberry plant, you know? Treat me like a blueberry tree and I'll really produce a lot of blueberries for you. And so anyway, that's, that's the kind of the importance of that. And then these are typical disturbances that can push you back to early successionals, which is disturbances, clear cutting, pesticides, herbicides, 
you know, events, tillage, you know, t when you till a, a farm, you annihilate all the soil biology, except for maybe bacteria. So again, if you have a lot of good soil food web in your soil, you're gonna have a good soil structure. It can hold more water, less irrigation requirements. Um, you're gonna have deeper roots. They can, deeper roots can mine more nutrients by themselves without having to add more fertilizers, another great benefit. Um, the plants have higher nutrient densities because the plants are actually performing at the level that they wanna perform at. So your mustard plant is going to be highly nutritious compared to one that's grown with a ton of fertilizers. Um, healthy plants are also um, don't don't have the weep the, the pest pressure that the ones that are more more uh, fertilized with fertilizers because fertilizers actually weaken plants' immune systems. Plants have immune systems, but when you weaken them, um, you've got to then spray other kind of chemicals like maybe fungicides or pesticides to keep them alive. Okay. And this, this is an example of getting back to the early slide where you have impacted soils versus native soils. And this is something I've, I've, I've done like over 1500 microscope assessments with soil or, or compost. So I've seen a lot of bad soil. And so on the, on the left side, the thing you're gonna see with anytime you impact soil anywhere with a lot of tillage or grading or movement or whatever, um, you're gonna have uh, high, very high bacterial counts, but nothing else. You won't see any fungi, you won't see any protozoa, no nematodes. Um, you'll see, um, and the soil has no ability, it's going to get compacted, and compacted soil, when it rains, what happens? Instead of absorbing into the soil, it runs off, it, it erodes, it creates a high flood event, and causes flooding. Um, and again, getting back to the high bacteria, what did we say earlier about early successional? You're, you're creating an environment for weeds. And f so if you think about what farmers do, farmers the, 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 the typical farmer plows their field and they put fertilizers out. So they're, they're, they've created the soil biology environment for weeds. And then, so then they plant their corn or their cotton or whatever. And what do they also spraying? Roundup, because they got all the weeds. Well, they're, they're, they're basically creating a environment for weeds, not for, but not for cotton or for corn. So they need to be modifying the biology to, to, to adapt, you know, things like corn, Soybeans are more mid-successional. They want a little more fungi. They're, they're, they're going to want some protozoa. And the weeds are going, wait a minute, I don't, I don't, I don't want that. You know, so they start to actually dissipate. Believe it or not, weeds will, will, not, will start to dissipate when soil conditions are not favorable to them. So again, native soils are going to have low... Let me just back up real quick. Um, I can go forward. You ready? Okay. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, so anyway, so if you want to, if you decide, if, 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 if you guys are out there and you say, hey, I, I want to change over from conventional um, growing things with fertilizers, I want to go more biological, how do I do that? So the first thing you got to do is you got to do a, an assessment, find out what do you have, you know, what maybe, maybe I've got some stuff already, maybe I got or, good organic matter, but you got to, you know, first of all, you're going to determine, first thing I do is I meet with clients and say, what are you trying to grow? You're trying to grow grass, trying to grow blueberries, trying to grow, grow you know, vegetables, or what are you trying to do? Next step is you, you assess the soil. Do, you know, do what, what kind of biology do I have? What kind of minerals do I have or compaction? And then, then, you, um, then you make really good compost. Compost is the source of micro, is missing organisms. So if you're low on organisms, you're going to use really good compost. Now, this is not av any average everyday compost. Now, the term biocomplete is not a proprietary product you buy off the shelf. It's actually the method you use to make compost that's really good. That's Dr. Ingham's, that's her little term. But it's not, it's not a proprietary product. It's really a proprietary method that if you take her school, you learn how to do it. And then, of course, you want to also, you know, periodically, there's some amendments that also um, can make the, the microbes uh, sustain themselves with some certain interesting things with, like, fish hydrolysate, sea kelp, things like that. Um, so here's a quiz for you guys. Okay, I want to grow the best strawberries in the world biologically okay so the first question is is in you know in nature where does where do you see strawberries growing in nature you have any idea where do you see where do you see strawberries growing um the, the places that I've, i typically have seen them wild strawberries they're growing underneath in, in in kind of a forested area and so what does that tell you that's that's a, a fungally based soil maybe like a two to one or five to one so believe it or not Strawberries like a fungal-based soil, so you you you, you know when, if you decide to grow 
strawberries in a pot and you dose it with fertilizer, you're trying to, you're really growing for weeds, not for strawberries. So these are the kind of things, these are the kind of decisions you make when you go through this. Um, again, composting, this is a method that Dr. Ann teaches, but it's basically thermophilic composting, which is where it heats up. And this particular method she teaches, it, and it's a small batch system, which again, scaling up is one of the things that I'm trying to work on right now. But this method is a great way to make, it's a great, it's the fastest way to make compost. And we'll talk about that later. So again, uh, things like annuals and vegetables are bacteria, you know, you can actually customize the compost to be more bacterial based or more fungal based. And, you know, of course the, Things like vegetables and turf are, are happy with bacterial uh, type compost, but then if you're trying to grow more shrubby things or like blueberries or even, even like an orchard, if you like a citrus or, or peach or something like that, you're going to want a more a real fungally based compost to amend to the soil. Again, composting methods, uh, thermophilic is where it heats up and believe it or not, it's the fastest way to make compost. It's only, you can, you can make compost as fast as two months. That's about as fast as you can make, ever make any kind of compost. Um, I say six months because ideally you make it, and once it cools down, it takes, it goes, it heats up several times after you turn it a few times, and then it cools down after about 20 days, and it'll cool down. And then if you can let it sit for another three or four or five months, it'll actually mature like wine and get more complex and more diverse organisms. But if you need it in two months, you, you got to use it. You wouldn't use it. Um, vermicompost is another excellent highly recommended system because worms add their version of bacteria that, you know, their, their own endemic bacteria in their gut to the, to the soil. And it's even, you know, plants love that stuff. And uh, worms also eat a lot of pathogens. They eat a lot of things that are, that are bad for soil. So they're good. And, um, but that takes a little longer. It's like three to six months. Um, the static pile, that's if, if you, in a backyard, if you said, Hey, I'm just going to just pile a bunch of leaves up maybe throw in some, some garden or some debris, like maybe some vegetable clip cutting, something like that. that. Ideally, that should sit for probably as much as maybe eight to 12 months because that way the worms will get in, they'll break everything down. Um, and if there's any pathogens, they'll get all consumed and they, it won't be so hard to use. But see, that's a slower process. It takes more time. There's a thing called a Johnson Sioux reactor, which a guy named Dr. David Johnson invented out in uh, Chico State, California. And it's very similar to thermophilic, excuse me, composting but it's it's kind of nice because you you create the same kind of three foot diameter container a box, uh, fence um, container about this big about that tall fill it full of wood chips or whatever and it'll decompose over a period of a year it takes a year to make it but it's really got some great stuff in it and he's having great success with it um, helping a lot of farmers out west i love the idea of a, of a finely aged compost pardon <laughs> i love the idea of a finely aged compost. yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> um, now you heard of compost tea the definitions that Dr. Ingham uses uh, compost extract uh, is where you take uh, if let's say you have a five gallon bucket you get a, you get a mesh bag and you put maybe 12 handfuls of, of compost in there and you hold on to it and then you dunk it in the water like a tea bag and you dunk it and you squeeze it. and what you're doing is you're extracting the organisms and the humic material into the water and that way you can spray it uh, it goes further you can spray it over larger areas Compost tea um, is, is uh, and compost extract, by the way, is geared towards spraying, uh, drenching the it's a soil drench. It's not used for foliar. Foliar means spraying on the leaves. But compost tea is when you take compost extract and then bubble it for, say, 24, 48 hours, and you add, you add oxygen with the bubbling, and then you also add some foods, and you actually grow the organisms. And that's, it's, it's generally a good idea. It's, it's a good thing to do, and you typically would use that for a foliar spray. Because the uh, when when bacteria and fungi when they grow in rapid numbers they actually create a glue um, that they use actually use in the soil but they create a glue when you spray it on a leaf it's a little barrier to to any like let's say you had a um, powdery mildew spore floating through the air which is a really bad disease for say mostly um, squash plants and when it hits that leaf there's there's like this glue uh, barrier on it it's it's going to have a, it's going to struggle to find a host cell to to uh, to grow into and i we did this at the white harvest farm and it worked pretty well so we're going to keep doing that as a standard procedure the the, the danger of uh or the, the two negatives of compost tea is that you can make bad compost tea because if you put too much food in there it can go anaerobic 
and that is bad because you can grow um, some, you know, some nasty um, pathogenic bacteria and things like that. And um, and also um, uh, in general, when you when you make compost tea, you're growing a lot. You you got so many organisms that when you clean up is very critical. The sterilization, you got to sterilize all your pipes, all your pumps and your hoses and your tanks and all that stuff. Extract's a little more forgiving. And so we, we do a lot of extract work out at uh, White Harvest Farm. So that's a, that's a tote and that's me up there with a pumping system and I'm making like 250 gallons of tote of uh, compost extract and we'll drench the beds with it. So we're really getting some good inoculation of the microbes into the soil. Okay, so these are some landscaping tips uh, for those who, you know, why does this, important to me because if you're if you're if you have like a home and you got landscaping and what are some things that i can do um using soil biology in mind you know that will that will benefit me so this is really kind of where kind of hopefully this will help you for example um first thing you need to do is understand the soil you've got is it compacted um is it waterlogged waterlogged is a tricky one because if you have soil that doesn't drain really well that's a real problem because it's hard to fix that and you got to be creative about how you fix it i mean you might have to get some under drain pipes but you got to have a place to daylight the pipe to be able to drain and dry out your soils. Um, compaction is a little easier to solve. You just got to have some organic matter to till in. Um, you do a mineral assessment. Am I, do I have enough calcium, magnesium, potassium, trace elements? Florida, you know, if you look at the, when glaciers, when glaciers came down across the um, United States, they went about halfway down and they dragged all these incredible minerals uh, out of the mountains uh, and they deposited them all over the, you know, from the Midwest and up you know, to Canada. And it never made it to Florida. So our soils in Florida are very deficient in a lot of trace elements. So you got to make sure you have some good trace elements because uh, plants need those to grow. And then soil biology, getting back, that's kind of what I do, but is doing an assessment for soil biology. Okay. While we're here, I wanted to ask, um, you know, what do you do to determine deficiencies? You know, is that where you um, ask uh, UFIFAS to do a, a study on your soil or? Is that something that uh, your well, you, you can yeah, and we can talk about that. That what IFAS does, um, they, they they do they have the soil test. They'll do if you want to send off a soil test, they'll tell you your, your pH. Um, they'll they'll tell you and uh, what they typically do on the IFAS, they they give you um, they know approximate target ranges for calcium, magnesium, potassium, things like that, phosphorus and sulfur. They give you say you say you're low, medium, or high. If you're low, you need to add it, if, and they tell you what rate to apply it. Nitrogen, that you can't test for nitrogen on a soil test, but it, but but it, they'll give you recommendations. Say, you know, put out for your lawn, put out two pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet per year, or something like that. They'll give you guidelines on nitrogen, um, and and I also do this. We'll talk about that. A little shameless promotion near the end, but okay, okay, you can. So then again, turf again, turf is an early successional plant, so. You know, it's it's bacterial-based plants, so it, uh, it doesn't. It, it fertilizers are not so bad, but obviously too much is bad because it really will. It likes a little bit of fungi, and any any little bit of of um, fertilizer or things like that will annihilate the fungi and the protozoa and all that. So, um, shrubs and trees are more fungally dominated. So they're they you know you you don't want to create a you know you don't, one of the things we'll show a picture of, but and one, um, I've seen some. Where people will grow grass right up to the tree trunk, and you need to have a, little, a nice big substantial mulch ring to the tree, the drip line of the of the tree, because that's a fungal environment. But but grass is bacterial, so if you put that grass up to the tree trunk, you're creating a soil type that's more for grass than for trees, and so trees aren't going to be super happy there. So that's an example of why how biology enters into your decision making. Again, fertilizers promote uh, bacterial soils, which are weeds. Um, mulches and compost are fungal foods. So again, if you're trying to grow good, really good blueberries or have a nice, get your live oak to really kick off, you want to do a good mulching around your tree. Not too much. You don't want to put too thick a layer because you can also suffocate. It's kind of a happy, happy balance. And then um, again, don't make, don't mix different successional plants like like turf and trees, like I was saying. But you know, it's funny. Um, in my yard, I haven't th haven't done this yet, but I really thought about doing. I've got some some really cool. Um, like I got, I've got some chestnut trees that I'm trying to grow, and I've got a really big mulch bed around the, the rip line. And I said, you know what? Maybe what I'll do is I'll go buy some strawberries and plant them in that in that mulch right around the tree. 
that's where you're that's where you're actually growing the right plant in the right location from a biological point of view. I haven't tried this yet, but I want to do it. Okay, you can. Um, again, compaction is a real big problem. Uh, if you can, you need to kind of mechanic initially. If you're building a new house, or if you're even trying to renovate your yard, if you can rototill some organic matter in there, that's a that's a big plus in relieving compaction. Um, organic matter needs to be a minimum of three percent. Our most of our soils in Florida are about one or two, one to one and a half percent. So way low in organic matter. So if you can till in some organic matter or some black cow or something to get your organic matter, that's that was that's important. And shrubs really need a lot of organic matter. And again, they 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 do better when they have a good fungal, a lot of home for their fungi to grow. Um, drainage issues are tough. Again, it's uh, better to address before you construction but it, sometimes people don't have that option and uh it's a tough one um but if you can if you can get you can dry out your soil a little bit that's better uh and then, then if you want to if you want to kind of if you've got like a shady spot in your yard um and your and your spouse doesn't care or your significant other doesn't care about you piling up some leaves in the corner that's what you should do is you know leaves live oak leaves fall around march or april and there's bags all over the city and those are like outstanding uh organic matter but you need to let it, it'll take a year for it to decompose. But um, the, when I looked under a microscope and I've looked at people's leaf piles that are highly decomposed, I see the, the best biology I've ever seen of old leaf piles of people just pile up or maybe some, maybe I guess some twigs you shredded with a shredder or something, just throw that in there and let them sit for six months or a year. And, um, and you then use that if you're going to, uh, let's say you wanted to, throws, you know, mulch your tomato plant or something like that. It's got a fungal requirement. You use that decomposed material and, and put it around your plants or, or maybe mulch around your live oak tree or your, or your citrus tree or your, pe or your peach or apple or something. Um, so, but it's got to be in a shady spot. This is an example up in Massachusetts. It's hard to see, but up in the right-hand corner, this was, um, all these lawns were taken care of by pest companies. And there's a severe drought up in Massachusetts, but up in the right-hand corner, this guy used complete biology, and it took him it took him about uh, close to a year to get the the uh, the flywheel to you know that flywheel turning where the biology was doing all the work. This guy doesn't put one bit of fertilizer, not one chemical in his yard, and almost no irrigation. And all these other yards, see how brown they are? They they're compacted. They're 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 they can't hold any moisture, and they're dying. They're loaded with chemicals because they keep spraying fertilizer to kind of revive the yard but the guy up in the right hand corner is just sitting back and watching tv instead of out in his yard so and this is a product that i've done like like on the upper left, upper left was a project i did with the unf where they had some um some some disease issues and they, they had a lot of uh, uh root feeding nematodes and those are you have good guys and bad guys in soil and the bad guys uh can be if you put enough good guys in there, they'll outcompete the bad guys. The bad guys are always kind of be hanging around, but if there's enough good guys around, uh, they will. There'll be so much competition that the good guys just can't can't compete with that. So we're dumping a lot of organic matter in here because the organic matter was really low. And this organic matter is something that I actually made, where it, it's it's been cured for like three to three to four months, and it's got I inoculated it with a lot of um, compost extract. So a lot of this this uh, this these wood chips. I have broken down and I looked under the microscope, but it's just loaded with organisms. So not only am I not only am I increasing the organic matter, there's also they're getting the benefit of um, a lot of organisms going in the soil too. Um, on the right is my yard where I've got a citrus tree, and you see I've got the the mulch ring around it, and I do a lot of you know, I put I put compost and mulch like twice a year to so to really feed those. That's what that plant wants. That citrus tree wants. A, a fungally mulch-based soil. It doesn't want sandy soil. You know, there's a little sidebar story. Uh, I met this guy down in South Florida at a conference up in Michigan, of all places, and um, this guy named Brad Turner. And you know, I don't know if you guys have heard of citrus greening, but it's a disease that's hitting citrus trees around Florida that's basically wiped out square miles of citrus. And they, they, there's no real good, the, the researchers have found no good solution to it. Well, they, they found these citrus trees that were growing, this had to be popping up in some of these uh, forested areas that had zero disease issues. And they realized it was all about the soil biology. So they started to really cultivate the soil biology around this, this, little, this these groves that were like starting to get disease and were weakened by the citrus greening. And all of a sudden they just came back to life. And now they're putting out bumper crops of oranges. They're, they're the quality, they measure the quality of the oranges and it's off the, the scale. 
And it's got the attention of the University of Florida. They're kind of waking up and going, oh, maybe we shouldn't put chemicals in our, our trees and maybe this is the way to go. And, 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 and uh, this guy, Brad Turner, got the 2021 Environmental Agriculture of the Year in the state of Florida for what he was doing. So this is, this met, this is a real thing. Um, this is the White Harvest Farm. This is an example of a plot where um, the, the, the kind of the, the plants that are growing up, this is where, you know, you, we're, we're growing a lot of things here. Uh, but the things that are sticking up are onions and uh, carrots. You can't see the carrots so much. Um, but we're planting a lot of other plants in there to sustain the biology. And in the middle, we plant, and that's where you walk. And that low, um, that little plant there is called, it's called mini clover. And we put, we put wood chips in between the, the beds. And the wood chips are great, again, fungal food, just kind of building up the soil health. And then we, sprint, we cast some uh, what are called mini clover, which is a clover that only grows about that tall. And uh, it makes a great little ground cover, you know, and it's, and it's not, you know, clovers are legumes, so they, they actually create nitrogen for soil. So we're, we're doing a lot of good things here. So this is my favorite, one of my favorite pictures we ever took on the farm. It's got so many things going on. There's some of the flowers, there's some buckwheat as a, as a cover plant that it attracts pollinators. That's just, and also uh, brings up phosphorus into the soil. So a lot of good things are happening. This is where I spent three years doing research on doing the soil biology um, thing. Okay. And these are some graphs. I know it's kind of hard to read, but in the research I did over three years, you remember I was talking about, yeah, these, you, when you decide what you want to grow, you have these target populations of microbes. Well, you see the horizontal lines on these graphs. The upper left is bacteria. I think upper right is fungi, lower left is protozoa, lower right is nematodes. As long as you're above that horizontal line, you've met that minimum requirement. So, and, and the, the horizontal access is time. And that's about two or three years, <coughs> excuse me. And the, and the vertical access is the micro population numbers. And, and uh, if you're above that line, that's a good thing. When you're below it, you, what do you, if you're below it, what do you do? You gotta add compost and keep driving those numbers up. So you can see as time went on, the fungi took a while. Um, I'm really going off on a, on a sidebar here, but fungi didn't really get good until later. Uh, and the reason was we weren't using high, we were using, we were diluting things, thinking that if we diluted, it would go further. And we realized we had to use full concentration extract and compost to really jack those numbers up. And then of course we got a big response. And then lower left is protozoa. You can see that those numbers started to take off as well. And then nematodes, Nematodes are tricky, um, but they they finally showed up near the end too. They're 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 very finicky, but they're very important though. And um, you know, if you go into nature, I, I I love going into nature, and you can scrape soil down about an inch and and look at it under a microscope, and you see all this stuff. I mean, that's that you see all these organisms just going at it, and you see a lot of the nematodes. And the whole point is to get those nematodes into your heart, home soils or where you're trying to grow. And so the, some of the takeaways, we had consistently higher yields. Where we, where we play compost or, or extract, we had really good yields. And those yields more than offset the cost of uh, adding compost and making compost and all those things. Uh, broccoli, was the heads were huge and they matured two, two weeks earlier. So it's a great thing for, for growing plants. Germination, you had a high success rate of germination and also it happened earlier. And again, you um, you start to really see the soil improve. The so crumb crumb structure is when the soil's got um, porosity in it, so it can absorb water and hold on to moisture. And not when it's compacted, it just can't hold on to any moisture very well. Okay, so this is this is my business, and so what do I do for a living? And uh, I work from anybody from a household all the way up to a ten thousand acre farmer, and um, and so. What I, and lately I've been getting a lot of people that want to do something in their backyard or something like they're a small farm. So I'll come out and do a full assessment. So you'll notice there's a the, the compaction of water logging is a physical test, and I've got tools to test all these things. Uh, mineral analysis, I send it off to a lab. They're getting back to the University of Florida. Um, I use another lab called Logan Labs, which is a, a lab up in Ohio that does a much more detailed analysis. So it's just my University of Florida is really geared towards real simple analysis, and they kind of cookbook it for you. And I like to do my own cookbooking, so that I want a more elaborate soil test. Um, I do my biological analysis, then I write up a report and say, this is your roadmap, this is what you need to do. And um, I've done some interesting projects. I did a project down in St. Augustine about three years ago. That was a, it was a, it was a hat company there based in Australia, but they had a distribution center in, uh, in, in St. Augustine. And the guy that owned the building wanted to do something, wanted to build a food forest behind his building, because they had a lot of land back there. 
and I, I came out there to soil test and the soil is very compacted. It had very, really low nutrients. And so I wrote a whole prescription on what to do. And we brought, and I said, first thing you got to do is call the power company, which is Florida Power and Light. And this is come in and bring truckloads of wood, wood, wood chips. Because wood chips are fungal food, but you got to let them break down before you can integrate them into soil. It's very important. They got to break down. And then, and then after you get everything put out and you, and you till these wood chips in, then you can plant with uh, these cover plant crop mixes of like things like um, uh, cow peas and sorghum and millet and oats and things like that that will start to feed the biology that's in the soil. And then after a period of two years, you've got a completely regenerated soil that was really an old dirt parking lot. And now they've got a great food forest there. So. So I do, and then um, I also make compost and make amendments and, um, and do um, full assessments and then also do projects like the project at UNF. I'll do those as well. So, so. these are some great resources, but there's a handout we've got that we can, um, that these can email you that I put together as kind of a summary um, of this. But these, these are, um, you can, YouTube's got so many videos, but Dr. Elaine Ingham is my mentor. She's got a ton of YouTube videos. Um, Dr. David Johnson, he's got developed the Johnson C reactor that makes, makes compost. But the cool thing about Dr. Johnson is that he is a full-blown professor and he does these, these peer-reviewed papers about the importance of soil biology with crop types. And he's got some amazing research. Um, Christine Jones is a woman from Australia. She's also very knowledgeable about this. James White is the latest guy that's doing some cool stuff that uh, Rise of Fahaji, the world of soil, soil biology is so fascinating. That, remember, I showed that slide of the soil bacteria, which are little spherical, little tiny cocci and bacillus. He has, he has found out that, that, that as roots penetrate through the soil and grow root hairs, that they will, the bacteria, which is like a little cell wall, will go inside the, the root hair and, the, and these, uh, these, these things called superoxides will take the, the cell wall off and the insides of the bacteria will float through and nourish the, the root and stimulate the, the root hair to grow. And then when the, cell, when the bacteria will exit out the root tip with a whole new cell wall. So this little bacteria that had a cell wall goes inside the root, it loses its cell wall, which has nutrients in it. By the way, the cell wall is loaded with nutrients. And then when it leaves the root hair, it's got a cell wall again. So it, that's, and this, then that, that just blows my mind. I, that nature like does that. Kind magic. Of stuff. It's crazy, <laughs> you know. And uh, podcast, uh, John Kent is a great podcast guy. And these are some websites. And I think that's the end of my presentation. So, all right. At this point, I can certainly answer any questions. Well, we do have one question uh, to start you off on Zoom. Okay. And it is from Kim Gazzoni Collier, who says When you say mulch, is there a specific type? Does pine bark count as mulch? And so, yeah, I think you've covered this a little bit, but I think to really um, kind of hammer it home for Kim. Yeah, mulch. So mulches, commercially, commercial mulches, you, you can get, um, the, the less processed, the better. Um, you know, you can get these colored mulches that are stained with like with oxides, iron oxide for red and black and things like that. I mean, my wife loves that stuff. I don't like it, but I do what the wife says. So I lose that argument. But by and large, you want to use the less treated um, material, the better. Um, something that will break down is better. Like a hardwood mulch is your ideal mulch, but it needs to be um, preferably de partially decomposed. Um, um, and, you know, pine bark is a really good um, material. Um, is uh, you know, of course the, the finer. I like I like more of the, the smaller chunks. Um, it will break down over time, and of course, it does create a lot of good acid. But it's but sometimes the uh, pine also has uh, you know pine is has got some antimicrobials because you know tree sap is a protecting uh, protectant fluid for the tree to protect against diseases. So sometimes it can kind of deter biology from biology from growing. Uh, but but um, anyway, to, to to summarize, mulches. Um, preferably, the ideal mulch would be a partially decomposed hardwood mulch. Cypress. Why is cypress a good mulch? Because it, it doesn't decompose and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't rot. Well, that's not really good for what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to it's actually, also not sustainable. Yeah, I'm trying to get things to rot, <laughs> right? So, and cypress is also not sustainable, right? I mean, you don't want to, you know, be using cypress as mulch. Is that true? 
uh, use insecticides. Cypress as a mulch is not a necessarily a good idea. Yeah, I mean, cypress, it, it all depends on what your belief system is, but cypress is a, you know, you're, they are typically in wetlands, so you're cutting them out of our precious wetlands. That's not good in some people's opinion. So there's that. But also, it, it's a uh, cypress. The reason cypress is a good mulch is because it doesn't decompose that well. Well, that, well, you actually want it to decompose to feed the biology. So that's that's a strike against cypress. Um, you know, I, I've got some of these red stain uh, mulch, or some kind of mulch. I think it's a hardwood mulch, and it seems to actually grow fungi pretty well, believe it or not. Um, I don't hope that answers your, your question. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I have my own question that I would ask. So um, I walk through my neighborhood all the time, and um, I'll see mushrooms growing on the um, grass. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's usually after a big rain. And I just wondered if, you know, if that's a sign of anything that you can talk about, you know, what that means when mushrooms are growing on sod. Yeah, the, usually, usually mushrooms that are growing in yards are, uh, again, what are mushrooms, what are fungi like? They like, they like uh, uh, a woody type material. So there probably was an old tree there or an old, or some, uh, that somebody cut down that, or maybe, maybe um, removed the stump, but it's still there. And of course, those fungi are all still living in that, that highly, fungal uh, food environment. So um, that's not all bad. Sometimes, uh, you know, there, there are some fungal diseases you got to watch out for, but by and large, mushrooms are a, generally a good sign. I, I would say that's a good sign, but as long as it's not so many of them that it's, you know, causes some other problems. So. Yeah. I prefer to think of, uh, think of them as lucky. Lucky, yeah, lucky. mushrooms. <laughs> lucky mushrooms, exactly. All right. Any questions any in questions the audience? Out there? Hmm? Yeah, biochar is an interesting product. It's it's got some pros and cons. Um, the pros of bi biochar is that uh, it you know um, the organisms in the soil like like a lot of carbon and they like nitrogen. Um, those two things together. And so and what is biochar? But 100% carbon. So and and our soils in Florida primarily are really deficient of carbon and organic matter. So it's a great soil amendment. The 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 one thing you got to be really the, um, you got to pay attention to with biochar is that it needs to be charged. And what charged means is you need to um, soak it, uh, either mix it with some, some compost, some really good compost, or some liquid like some compost extract, or let it sit overnight 24 hours. And all those little organs will get into the pores of the biochar. And then and then you can spread it out now, the, and and it'll if, and you can also charge it with manure too, like horse manure or something like that. Just anything to get the organisms uh, ch charging that and to get it active. Because if, if you just throw it on the grass and throw it on the dirt, and expect it to do anything, it's not going to do anything. Um, it's very expensive. That's a, one of the dark sides of biochar. It's very expensive. But if you're just doing a lot on a small scale, like you have a small garden, I think it's a great thing. You know, um, you just got to know how much to put out. So. Um, but I would say, yeah, and, and what I do, I actually use biochar on a small amount. And I'll, I, I actually take some of my good compost and then I throw it in a worm bin, let the worms churn through it. That's the second step of composting. And then I'll actually throw in some biochar with the worms because the worms like to have a, a little, uh, you know, abrasive type material for their guts. And it's also good for the vermicompost. So it's, uh, I do like it, but again, it's, it works well on a small scale, but I mean, I wish we could um, put it on a large scale because it would really solve a lot of our organic matter problems on some of these big farms that have just nothing in terms of organic matter. Good question. Yep. Other questions? Mm -hmm. uh, well, no, I think the, the, you know, of course, pine trees grow in different environments like there's you know like longleaf pines like more sandy hills and then slash and loblolly like more of a wet soil but that although that's not always true they they both go in, in different directions but that's kind of the trend um and of course the uh, sand hills are where a lot of the good housing developments would go so they they cut those down or, or that's where the farm that's where the farm should go right so they'll strip off all the all the nice um um, longleaf pines, and so now they now and but it's but now farmers if they don't want to grow a farm they'll they'll say well I'm just going to put put it in pine trees because it gives them the green belt the low tax status and it treats it, they're, they're still considered a farmer, um, but um, it's it's really it's a great question, and you know the and I don't know much about this is one something I like to learn I'm a real history buff and I've, I always like to learn more about the whole timbering thing because in the late 1800s and early 1900s all the really big old growth wood all over the southeast was all cut out because that's where the money was i mean the money the big we made a ton of money on these giant slabs of wood 
And but all those really, God, they really found every one of them. There's not many places that have the original old growth stuff in, around Florida. So a lot of what grows back is what are either native pines or maybe even pines you planted. But but but, but you might see a pine forest that's mostly uh, loblolly pine that looks natural, but it may have been clear cut at one time, but just came back naturally. So. Good question. Yeah. Um, do you have much experience with worm composting or worm farms? Have you done much of that? Um, yeah, I, I mean, you can do it. The worm big, composting big is, is a failure in that area. Yeah, we're, I, I'm really into it because of the, in the top two methods that I recommend, there's, there's a lot, there's, I went to a University of Florida uh, um, master gardener thing where they said the topic of it was 19 ways to compost. And it really, you can compost so many ways. But my two favorites are the thermophilic, which is where it heats up, and then also worm, is my set worm composting. Because, you know, worms, when, if you put like, and worms, will love, they love things that are like, like manure. They love, the, they love manure, believe it or not. And, and so, like, decomposed horse manure is a great material. And given about, even though manure in itself would not be something you want to put on a plant, because it may have E. coli or something like that, the worms will, over time, will sterilize that, that, that uh, manure because they eat everything in that pile. And when it goes through their gut, it will destroy it. They'll literally, that the little E. coli bacteria gets annihilated in, in the gut of a, of a worm. And then they poop out stuff that's got better stuff. And there's all kind of, form, there's, there's things that they're finding in worms' guts that have uh, growth hormones for plants. So it's, it's a great uh, compost for plants. And for worms die every time. I, I can't do it anymore. I can't kill any more worms. Well, they, so the sad. worms, that were, uh, red, you want to use red wigglers. Red wigglers are the worms you buy. You can buy them online. They're, they're, they're the composting worms. They like, they like a very, they have a very narrow temperature band from like 60 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And ideally, it's inside your house. <laughs> you know, not people, what people have it inside their house. But if you can put it in a cool area, um, and as long as you, and you got to feed them too. I mean, don't, you, you, they can go a long time without eating. The other thing about worms you got to be careful about is overfeeding them because uh, the, the the real the trick to feeding worms is you put food on top of the of the pile and it, if it's gone in three days it's the right amount of food if it's still there after three or four days you put too much out the food that I the, the best foods I found are they absolutely love melons they love watermelons and what you can I mean you, you eat the good part right and you you put the rind with all the a little white meat and you put that, you force it down on the end of the worm compost, and in three days, it'll be like this little piece of thin skin left, and they eat everything. They don't like, they don't brought, they like broccoli. <laughs> I put, you know, collard greens and broccoli, they don't like that, but they love melons. They love, they love things that are just kind of sweet, like apples and bananas and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, they like, they like sweet things, apparently. Well, maybe I'll give it one more try. Yeah, keep uh. it cool, feed them, um, keep it, also, <clears throat> excuse me, um, vermicompost likes to be in a very moist environment. Um, you know, um, when you make when you make thermophilic compost, the ideal moisture content is about fifty percent. And so the question is, is well, how, how do I measure? If it, how do I know it's fifty percent? How do you measure that? That's a, that's <laughs> ridiculous. You know, how, why do I have to do that? But there's a really easy trick to how you do it. If you take a pile of your thermo, thermophilic compost and you grab a handful and squeeze it really hard and one drop drips out, they found that that's about 50%. If three drops come out, it's probably 60%. And if nothing comes out, you need to add water. <laughs> but but vermicompost likes to be 60 to 70 to 80, you know, 60 to 70%. So it's gonna be pretty, it's gonna be pretty moist, but not too moist because uh, it gets too moist, it can create anaerobic environments, which is bad. So it's, it's again, it's kind of like, you gotta get the perfect balance, but they're, they're pretty tough. They, they should be able to, Survive pretty good. I'll have to see what you're doing. If you show me a picture of what you're doing, I probably can help yeah. you with it. All right. We have um, a couple of questions on the uh, Zoom. Um, so one is, if my St. Augustine grass is thin, does adding rye seed over the winter help the soil? Adding rye seed? Rye seed. Okay. Well, there's um, there's different kind of rye seed. Um, I know that there's the, there's the rye that you, you throw out in your yard to make it look green and pretty in the wintertime. Um, it's uh, that's a good anything you plant is going to be good because anything plant is going to be feeding the microbes. The thing, the thing about the, the, the green, there's different types of grass, the rye grass, and I'll talk about different types. But the kind you throw out in your yard to make it look green only only lasts, gosh, three weeks or three or four. It doesn't last that long. 
So, but I wouldn't, I would, I would say it's more good than bad. I mean, it's, it's certainly going to help. It's going to add a little, when, it, when the plant dies, it's going to provide a little bit of nitrogen to the soil. Um, and the roots of the plant will feed the microbes. But there's other, um, there's more agricultural styles of types of rye. There's called annual rye, there's cereal rye. Annual, annual rye uh, is a cover um, plant seed that farmers will use in the wintertime. And it's a th it looks, it's, it's kind of a plant about that big that grows about that tall. It's really thick. Like th it looks like, looks like uh, turf grass, like, like almost like a turf grass. But it's, uh, you know, ant cows love it. But it's got this really dense root system. So any kind of really dense root system is really good for soil. It's good for the microbes. Um, and then cereal, I think cereal rye is this, these massive uh, plants that get pretty tall and the cows love to eat that in the wintertime. But that's more of a, more for cow feed than it is for the roots. But the annual rye is a great plant. You got to buy it under certain, you got to buy it on, in specialty stores. But anyway, that's probably the best answer I can give. Great. Um, we do have a question on here uh, about uh, will a recorded version be available? Yes, so this will all be on our blog in a few days. Um, it'll be a full video of Alan's talk, but we'll also put all the resources that you included in your slides. And we'll even post the slideshow because there are a couple of slides on there that have tables that I think would be helpful for people to, to reference. So um, look for that in a few days. Okay. Any more questions from the audience? I got one. Yeah. Are there any deficiencies that you're running into Yeah, um, I've done a lot of soil tests, and Florida, soils in Florida, this is actually a great question, because it all depends on the type of soil test. There's soil, some soil tests will, there's a test called a Malik 3 test, and it's a certain range of acids they use to extract the minerals out of the sand particles. And um, it's, they're trying to mimic nature, that the, the, the biology and fungi will, bacteria and fungi will also try to, will also acidify and pull nutrients out. And in Florida soils, there's a lot of, uh, calcium levels are generally pretty good. Magnesium is not too bad, sometimes a little low. Um, phosphorus is kind of so-so. Um, sulfur levels are low. And potassium levels, potassium is, is always really, really low. Um, and then of course, trace, I would say the two things, if you did nothing else in your yard, potassium and the trace elements. The trace elements are, are really, really tricky. There's, there's a lot of, research being done about how the best way to apply trace because you don't need much of it and too much can really wreck things. Um, but um, what was I going to say though? Um, but the, um, the, when it comes to potassium, um, there's the, the, the cheap stuff is called is potassium chloride. The chlorides are horrible. For, it, it wrecks the soil. It, it wrecks the soil biology. So if you're going to use a potassium product, use like a, a potassium sulfate. Uh, is, is, is recommended. It's, it's, um, so that's a good one. Um, and um, I'm trying to think what other, there's, there's some, there's some, again, agricultural sales people have better resources for these things than some of these local people. Uh, it's hard to find, you know, there's some boutique people that have some, have some small sources of really good minerals and stuff. Um, but I would say those, and then of course, getting, but, but getting back to the Melic 3, that uh, your, your Melic 3 test is going to come back and say, oh, I have tons of calcium, you know. But guess what? Not, but, you know, 95% of that is insoluble. And so you, even though it looks like you've got a ton of it, if you don't, if you have no biology, it's essentially unavailable to the plant. So you, that's where, the, if you get the biology levels up and the organic numbers up, up high enough, then they'll start gnawing away at that calcium that's already there. And so you don't need to add more. A, the, a real sad thing that happens down in, a lot of farmers do this all over the country, but in Hastings, um, they, they, um, they, they, to grow potatoes, they keep putting out gypsum every year. Well, gypsum is calcium, I think, calcium carbonate, I think. And so they're, they're trying to get the calcium numbers up. Well, the, when you do a soil test, like a, a normal calcium level in a soil test in Florida would be about 2,000 parts per million. It's 10,000 parts per million in Hastings. And when you have that much calcium, because they just keep adding it every year, because gypsum will provide some, a little bit of soluble calcium to the plant. That's why they do it. But guess what? They're adding, they're just adding this giant, 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 giant bank of calcium, and that calcium, calcium is what is, is kind, of, it's kind of like the life force of soil, but it's also the bully. 
because too much calcium will, will basically lock out other minerals from being absorbed into the plant. So they're, they're solving one problem and creating 10 other problems when they add so much gypsum. So. My goodness, so many things <laughs> to yeah. keep in mind. Um, any other questions before we end for the evening? All right, can we give a round of applause to Alan for sharing some really great information with us? Thanks. We're so grateful. And I want to just um, share my screen one more time to uh, remind people how you can get in touch with Alan. Um, he's uh, at Soil Life, Soil Life Organics, soillife.net, and you can reach him at alan at soillife.net. That's some business cards over here too, if you are interested. Yeah, and all of his contact info will also be available on our blog. Also, a little shameless promotion, but it's really not shameless promotion. But I, I have a Facebook page and Instagram, and and my philosophy about social media is only post things that are factual, that are that are things that benefit the public. I don't I don't get into political stuff. I just write, hey, look, this is what I tried. This worked really well for my for my soil, and this is how I did it. I try to educate people because that's I want to spread the word about what I'm doing. I, I'm 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 not here to be proprietary. I want other people to do what I do because we need to spread the word about this method because it's a great method and other people should be doing what I do. And I'm, I'm not the least bit competitive in that regard. I, I want to I want to um, work synergistically with people. I don't want to be competitive with them. So great. That's it. Thank you so much. All right. So I just want to share a couple of um, messages with you. Um, one is that uh, the Garden Club sells pecans every year. And so you may have seen them when you come in. We'll be offering them to sell you um, as you leave, if you like. Um, they are delicious. They are fresh. Um, they were literally harvested just a couple of weeks ago. So straight from the farm to the Garden Club, if you're interested. And they're available for anybody um, who's at home. You can come by the Garden Club and pick them up whenever you like. Um, our next um, uh, horticulture corner program will be bird habitats with Jody Willis, um, who will be talking about how you can grow groceries for your birds, which, um, you know, birds are one of the um, species that uh, if birds are doing okay, everybody's doing okay. Um, I want to remind you that uh, this weekend is the Luminaria Festival. If you're not familiar with the Riverside Avondale Preservation Luminaria, um, that happens every year. Uh, this year, it is on December 12th, and we have a festival here at the Garden Club to celebrate it. We put out Luminaria all along our street. We do it for our neighbors as well. We'll have um, vendors in the uh, ballroom selling uh, environmentally themed and handmade products. Um, we'll have uh, Go Tuckin, who will be doing tours of the Luminaria, um, coming and going from the Garden Club. We'll have a bar. We'll have all sorts of fun stuff going on here. We have a holiday DJ going as well, so it'll be a fun night. Uh, it's a free event, so come by December 12th. And uh, coming up in uh, January is a really great event with Eileen Thompson. She owns a company called Farm Gal Flowers out of Orlando, and she is um, all about farm to table flowers. You've heard about farm to table food. Well, she's about homegrown flowers that she uses in her designs, just like the one she's holding there. Um, she has a lot of great things to say. And source, I'm sure soil biology plays a big part in what she does. So if you're interested in seeing her, and it's also part of a, a, a day of uh, um, demonstration and a catered lunch afterwards. So that is January 27th. Um, we have Bartram Trail Tales, um, where we have uh, some folks from the Bartram Trail Society of Florida who will be here talking about the Bartram Trail and, the, and the, where it intersects with Northeast Florida. Um, it'll be a great presentation and very um, informational. And a couple of things um, on the horizon. We have our giant flea market in February. That's February 26th. Um, put it on your calendar. It is the place to reuse and recycle. So if there, um, you know, every man's trash is another man's treasure. <laughs> and we believe in keeping things out of the landfill. So um, check out the flea market in February. And then our giant plant sale is in April. Um, that's April 8th and 9th. And um, we grow lots of plants. Our members uh, propagate them and bring them here and we um, sell them. But it is also a day with lots of other vendors that sell plants will be here and, uh, and lots of uh, environmentally themed vendors in the ballroom. It's a, a big event and we hope that you will join us. Um, I would like to take a moment to ask you to take our survey. Um, every program that we do, we really want to get your feedback. Can't tell you how important that is to us. We want to know how we're doing, what you thought of this program, and what programs you'd like to see in the future. 
So um, if you are at home, you can scan this code on your screen. You'll also be getting a link on your chat. And if you're here in person, we have it here for you to scan as well. We'll send it to you afterward, but why wait? You can tell us what you think right now. It's only a couple of questions. And once again, I'd like to thank the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund for making programs like this possible. And I want to thank Alan once again, Daniel, my colleague, and all of you for being here, because if you weren't here, we'd just be talking to ourselves, and what fun is that? So thanks for being here tonight. Thanks for being here from home, and have a great day. See you later.